So what I'm going to do for the next few minutes is develop a, a concept which I'm going to call uh, the data city. And the reason why I'm calling it the data city is we we're talking about the smart city and the real smart city. And what I'm trying to do is just an as if, it's not something which is fully uh, formalized, uh, but it's a way of just making a distinction between some of the terms that we're using. But in order to do that, what I'm going to do is look at the notion of, uh, you were talking about data as medium. What I'm going to look at is one particular uh, form of representation, which is the map. Uh, the map as a form of technology, as a form of techniques. And in order to do that, I'm going to look at one uh, particular example, uh, which is um, from contemporary Irish theatre, a play by uh, Brian Friel, which is called uh, Translations. So the structure of the talk will be to look at representation of space as a map, as a process of uh, colonialization. Ask me if you can be louder. Oh, louder. OK, sure. Good. <laughs> okay. So we're going to look at the map as a process of colonialization. And then from the map as a process of colonialization, I'm going to take out certain characteristics. And I'm going to refer to uh, a particular a text by Jack Derrida called Foy Savoir. And I would like to thank Anne Alambert, who pointed this citation out to me about two weeks ago. And in it, we have an understanding of what Jack Derrida calls tele-techno-scientific machines. And what he says is that they are dislocated, delocalized, expropriated, disideomatized, which I'll explain, and uprooted. So the structure is to look at um, an imaginative understanding of what a map is and to look at the process of translation within the play to show how we get dislocated, delocalized, expropriated, depossessed, de-atomatized, de-idiomatized space. Okay. So go on to the first slide. So that's the original uh, play in, from 1980. If you go to the next slide. Okay, I'm going to leave the Spanish one up for a second. Okay. So, um, in the play, Translations, has as a backdrop the ordnance surveying of Ireland in the 1820s and 1840s. Ireland acts as an historical colonial example through which the representation of space acts as a means of imposing colonial power. Within the Irish colonial context, the ability to map the territory acts as a mode of taking control of space, a space which is linguistically and culturally resists the attempts of cartography. So we go to the next slide. So this image here is of the first um, techniques which were used to map Ireland. And these are particular coordinates which are being used. Okay. So Ireland acts as a testing ground for forms of governance for the British Empire. Ireland served as a test ground for these ordnance surveys. It is only after the ordnance surveys of the 1820s and 1840s that uh, the techniques and mechanisms necessary for the mapping of other colonial territories, such as India, are formulated. In one way, the island of Ireland acts as a laboratory, a testing ground for experimental mapping techniques and technologies. In the Irish uh, survey of the 1820s and 1840s, local Irish scholars were recruited to assist the process of Anglicization. This survey uh, then leads to the great trigonological survey of, of India, which is the next slide. So what we have, I would argue, 
is a form of technique and technology which is then expropriated and used to uh, map India. These surveys of producing maps rationalize the colonial space, taking symbolic possession to rendering it as data, or perhaps we could use after Pedro, data as medium also. It could be argued that the translation of locality, which I'll come back to in a moment, acts as, a, as, as an intrinsic process to the mapping of space. Through this survey, the principle of scientific cartography, the principle of the neutrality of maps based on detailed and rigorous data collection and mathematical techniques were established. Thus, the mapping of the territory was ultimately knowable. Once there was sufficient data with these hegemonic representations superseding all other claims, the map, in other words, was the territory. So if you think of uh, Borges's short story on the exactitude of science, next slide. this is a, I don't know if you know the text, but it's like, it's a very short story. <laughs> that is the story. So, what we get here is a, a form of map, a form of mapping of the territory. So the map is as big as the territory. So what we have in one way is Borges deconstructing the notion of territory and map. When the map and the territory are the same, it becomes very difficult. A form of stupidity, where the map and territory are one and the same. It is within this context that the Irish playwright Brian Friel explores the inability of language to map onto the world in his play translations. In translations, the ordnance surveying of town lands and villages of Ballybeg, Ballybeg is a fictionalized space within which all of Brian Friel's take place, all his plays take place. Literally, it means the small town. The small town acts as a metaphor for the colonialization of space. The dispossession of land and the equal distribution of taxes are the motivation for the Ordnance Survey. Friel uses a technique through which the characters use forms of English. Simply put, Hiberno-English to act as the Irish language and a form of Standard English to act as English. The characters are pretending to speak Irish while they speak a particular form of English, which we call Hiberno English. In the character, in the play, we have a character, Owen, who is misnamed by the English soldiers as Roland, which causes slight confusion in the play, who acts as an interpreter between the two languages. This, of course, is of a profound irony for the contemporary Irish audience, who no longer speak Irish. As they laugh at the English soldiers struggling to speak Irish, and the Irish, uh, the English soldiers struggling to speak the Irish language, and they laugh equally at the Irish struggling to speak English, yet the whole play is in English. Within translations, the Ordnance Survey of Ireland acts as a backdrop to a love story between the English soldier um, Yoland and the Irish peasant Mora. The unfolding of their love story takes place as the townland of Ballybeg becomes the place of contestation. The history of the space is a contested one, where the mapping process is a dislocation of space. The mapping of the territory is also a translation of the original place names into the English language. The territorialization of space is not simply the use of cartography, but also the use of linguistic colonialization. In the play, language itself becomes problematic, something to be distrusted and unstable. In the Irish context, the fact that one is confronted with language when, t when one tells one's own story is an inherently political act. The local cultural specificity where the names are slippery things linked to the local and or, to local oral, oral, oral history is a very denial of the 
very locality of translation. So we just take one, I'm going to take one, one or two quotations from the play. So um, this is towards the end of the play, and Hugh is the, the schoolmaster, and there's been a lot written about this because in the play, Hugh is portrayed as this very erudite uh, teacher who speaks both Latin and Greek. I'm going to leave that alone because there are a lot of uh, interpretations about the play itself being a portrait of a certain form of Irish nationalism, which I would deny, but I'm going to leave that aside. Okay. So at the end of the play, Hugh says, it can, and it can happen, to use an image you'll understand, it can happen that a civilization can be imprisoned in a linguistic contour which no longer matches the landscape of fact. In the play, the ultimate outcome is the Ordnance Survey map is produced. The Irish place names are translated or anglicized. The imperial power ultimately has a map, but one which does not fit the landscape, where words, language, and the world are inherently unstable. Brian Friel does not shy away from the philosophical undercurrents. In fact, he cites Martin Heidegger in the program notes for the first production of the play Translations in 1981. It's a very famous citation from Heidegger where he talks about language as the house of being, which we put up. And I'm not going to read it, but what's very interesting in this example, which is a very famous example from Heidegger, is that he says when we, we, when we got to the well, we go through the woods. We're always going through the word well through the word woods, even if we do not speak the words or do not do anything relating to language. Now, what happens in the play is that the word well is used as a problem of translation. So in the play, the word well, which in Irish is tobar, acts as a point of reference on the landscape. We pass through the word well, and we pass through the word tobar, which is not the same thing. In the play, the place name Tober Vri is part of an oral history where once a man died by falling into a well near a crossroads. And the name given in the Irish language reflects this oral history, Tober Vri. Vri is a mispronunciation of the original name of the man who died, which is Vrion or Brian. Tober Vri, I argue, acts as a mode of idiosyncratic usage. Idiosyncratic in the sense of non-standard. It could be argued that idiofree, act, sorry, Tober Vri acts as a, form, as a form of idiolect. It has gained the form of referential fixedness, or you could argue an ontological grounding. In linguistic terms, the fixed idiom has become a referential expression. To translate this into the English language in a literal sense would not make any sense. We could have well, vri, or Brian well. What is of note is that the hesitation about the translation into English comes not from Yoland, the English soldier, but from Owen, the Irish scholar who is meant to be helping. Let's put up the next slide. So this is the conversation. So what we have is we have Owen and Yoland with a map, literally, and they're trying to put the English anglicized terms on the map. So the question I put to you, Lieutenant, is this. What do we do with a name like that? Do we scrap Tober Vri together, all together, and call it what? The cross, the crossroads? Or do we keep piety with a, long, with a man long dead long forgotten, his name eroded beyond recognition, whose trivial little story nobody remembers or nobody in the parish remembers. From this example, we can see within the play, the ordnance survey techniques and technologies are confronted with the impossibility of standardization, not of, just of space, but also of place names. However, in doing so, Freer presents not just the problematics of the translation of idiom, but also the mapping acts as a form of dislocation 
as a form of delocalizing. The names no longer correspond to the things themselves, where the localized meaning carrying with it the oral history has been erased, confiscated, or uprooted. The dislocation in, the case, in this case leads to a loss, literally to a loss of direction, to a loss of space, to a loss of knowledge. The characters no longer know where they are on the map. So we just put up the next quote. So here again, they're looking, both characters are looking at the map. And Owen says, on past burnt foot, there's nothing around here that has any name that I know until we come to down here to the south end, just about here. And there should be a ridge of rocks. Have the sapers marked it? They have, look, George. Where are we there? I'm lost. So within the play, the characters become lost. They no longer are able to read the map to locate themselves. The mapping of the territory becomes a metaphor for colonization, where the local is expropriated, dislocated into new meanings where the map and the landscape are no longer match, no longer coincide. In the play, therefore, the cartographic processes of mapping <coughs> locality leads to forms of dislocation, delocalization, and expropriation. The standardization of place is a form of colonization of that space. So in the next section, what I'm going to try and do is take some of those characteristics, this dislocation, delocalization, expropriation, disidiomatization. So here we could see the problem of translation of the idiom, is what I pointed to a second ago. And what I'm going to do is um, see if we take these characteristics that Derrida points to as a form of understanding of what the smart city or what the what smart, technolo smart city technologies do. Okay. So again, we're moving from an example which is a fictional example within a play, something which is much more concrete. The characteristics of the smart city have a relation to the characteristics of digital technologies that Jack Derrida in Foy and Savoir explained. Whilst he is positing a, an argument against the rise of fundamentalist thinking, which tried to recuperate the local, he gives a framework within which to posit the characteristics of what he determines tele-techno-scientific machine. So this is the first part of the quotation. It is interesting, so at the time, uh, you know, at the time when, when, when Derrida was writing this text, email hadn't really come into, hadn't come into widespread usage. I think at the time he was thinking more of, in France, what was referred to as the, as the Minitel. I'm not too sure he was talking about email. Uh, and definitely social media <laughs> did not, ha had not yet happened. So Derrida is talking about a particular format of what he calls um, tele-techno-scientific machine. And what I imagine he's referring to is something like the Minitel. Okay. But it's interesting to use this conceptual framework to see uh, if it could be related to the smart city. Okay. So uh, again, this is my own translation of Derrida. When they feel threatened by the expropriating, delocalizing de de tele-techno tele science, the people fear a new form of invasion. They are terrified by the populations whose growth and presence are incalculable. Then we go on to the next quotation. Okay, I'll leave it in French for a second. So the phenomenon of, of, of ignorance and irrationality, which are so often uh, pointed to in fundamentalism, for Derrida behind it, there's something much more profound. It's a reaction against itself namely the dislocation, the expropriation, uh, the delocalization, the uprooting, the desetimatization, and the dispossession. So when we look to the work of uh, Bernard Stiegler, we can understand the city as a complex exosomatic organism where the city uses these tele-techno-scientific machines as sensors, cameras, the Internet of Things, Discourses around the promotion of smart cities around the world tend to highlight the interconnected nature of the city 
through the data that can be collected through physical centers, sensors, but also the data itself as related to space. There's a new form of the production of abstract, abstract space, to use uh, Lefebvrean terminology. The question, what is the city, is replaced by what data, or as John pointed out, what forms of optimization are being used, analyzed within the cityscape. The smart city discourse tends to promote the data which is being collected as real time, a form of real time management of the city, the management of traffic flows, management of pollution, management of noise, management of the built environment. The discourses, pre the discourses present the smart city as a positive technological advance where the city is given anthropomorphic characteristics as responsive, interactive, even intelligent, even smart. The real-time element gives the illusion of permanence of present. The present is what is available, the here and now, <coughs> the hick and nook. So we could argue that there's a form of permanent present, something which is ahistorical, something which is uprooted, where the past and the future are not of relevance, where there's no need for human deliberation or reflection. The smart city, therefore framed as ahistorical, the city of permanent presence, where real-time data visualization of the here and now as citizens move and interact as they work and sleep. The uprooting of the present is enabled by these technologies, where the present predominates and acts as a form of dislocation. The time and space of the city is reduced to the production of a form of abstract space. It is a dislocation of the present, an uprooting as a form of relocation of the past into an ever-present. The ability to capture and survey the citizens as they move in space and time has a particular consequence in relation to the securitization of space. As the space can be monitored, people can be watched, and the security of the space guaranteed. Okay, I'm kind of run down time now. I'll skip through it. Okay, I'm just going to go to the final section for a second. So, um, here, in the final section, I'm going to look at the term locality for a second. Locality understood as the condition of possibility of openness. And at the same time, if we consider a locality as a, as a performative in itself, as Paolo has argued, and elsewhere we have had interesting discussions with Paolo, Bernard, Sarah, and some other people involved in a project called Geneva 2020, we could consider that in the form of performativity, uh, if we go back and look at the utterance as a condition of possibility of meaning, then we can have a relationship between locality as a condition of possibility of openness and the utterance as the condition of possibility of meaning. Okay. So I'm going to skip through a piece and just go to the, the essential of this. So what I would like to develop just for a few minutes is the performative as negentropic, as a negentropic gesture, aesthetic, linguistic, and political. It has the characteristics of an event, but I would argue it is a particular form of grounding of performativity as temporal and as counter-entropic. Gesture here as a movement in space and time which can hold its own significance and therefore be meaning-making. Locality as the condition of possibility of openness of the negentropic has a correlation with an understanding of the utterance pre searle pre the theory of speech acts, and in France, a correlation with some of the work done after Emile Benvenest and the Language of Denunciation. So if we go back to the origin, in one way, it is to H.P. Grice. When we go to, back to H.P. Grice, the utterance acts as a condition of possibility of meaning. The sentence utterance was one form of utterance, but only one form. For Grice, we have a theory of utterance as it's linked to a theory of speech acts. A performative act, which is not necessarily a speech act in, in, in Searle's terms, in the utterance, in the Gricean sense, is larger than the sentence utterance. For Searle, for John Searle, the concentration on the speech act as a form of promise tends to lead to an understanding of performance as a surfic, at, at a surface linguistic level. We think of the need for a theory of utterance. 
In Grice's theory, utterance is the conditional possibility of meaning. A fundamental characteristic of language is to be meaning-making, to be polysemantic, both the generation of new possible meanings and the guardian of etymology, of the history of meaning. The conditions of possibility of the Gricean utterance are the conditions of possibility of new idiosyncratic usages, of new idioms and of new meanings. Just in our example in the play uh, Chobar Vri, language has the possibility of creating new meaning. The utterance is the condition of possibility of the creation of new meaning. For Benvinist, this is slightly different. For Benvinist, we have, the no we have the notion of the moment of enunciation. In the moment of enunciation for Benvinist, an utterance is always a process of interlocution. Every act of utterance has an I and a U. So locality, as the condition of possibility of openness, as a performative, is something which can appear and disappear. It's something which is temporal. So to conclude, uh, the idiomatic, the idiolect, is conceivable because of the condition of possibilities of what we are calling locality. Locality as a condition of possibility of new bifurcations, new singularities. The language system is closed as a system in one sense, in, if we think of semiology and Ferdinand de Saussure, but language is always open to the generation of new meaning which performs in the world. It is this opening of language onto the world of possible meanings which is at stake with the advent of computational standardization, or as John pointed out, optimization of language. Language as a closed system, as a closed locale, ignores the openness of language to poesis, to new meanings. The conditions of possibility of locality in, lingu in linguistic terms, the ability of language, the utterance, the moment of enunciation, to the condition of possible new meanings, here the linguistic locality as idiomatization or the aesthetic locality as an act, as acts as a form of counter standardization, counter optimization, or in John's case, we could think of the flaneur, can be seen to represent things which cannot be calculated. The linguistic utterance and the aesthetic gesture are forms which are micro negantropic. To fight entropy, or entropy with an A and a H, we cannot do so at a universal level. Counter entropy can only take place with, at a local level in locality. So finally, just to fully conclude, um, when Glisson speaks of the archipelago, he also speaks of the idiom, that it acts as an idiolect, or the, the Caribbean can act as an idiolect and an idiom itself. The archipelago acts both as a function, uh, as a specific form of morphology, such as the city of Waikil, but the archipelago also metaphorically conceived, can think of new notions of re relationality. The data city, the term that I'm using, attempts to encapsulate the idiomatic of the archipelago by taking into account locality as the condition of possibilities of openness. That's it. Thank you.